go ahead and open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, third chapter here in 1 John. We made it down to verse 11 the last time we were together. That is where we will pick it up this morning. Uh, Now last week, man, last week may have been my favorite study of the year because there's nothing more um, exciting to me personally than expounding upon the astonishing love of God. And if you happen to miss that, man, that's one you've got to go back and get uh, understanding the astonishing degree of God's love for you and I. Uh, that is an absolute game changer uh, to your Christian experience. Now, um, you remember John. <clears throat> he is the last apostle alive at the time of this writing. He's been around the block uh, more than just about any Christian brother you're going to come across. Again, uh, this guy has personally seen some of the most remarkable spiritual events that have ever taken place upon the planet. He's seen dead people get up and walk out of graves. He's seen Jesus glow in the dark. He's seen healings and miracles and exorcisms. He's seen some pretty freaky spiritual stuff. And yet, again, by his own testimony, what made the greatest impression upon John's heart wasn't any of those things. The one singular thing that just rocked John's world and and made him who he was uh, as a man of God, was, was his understanding just the astonishing, over-the-top, crazy, wondrous love of God for you and I. Here is Christ. He is co-eternal with the Father and, and the Spirit, existing completely outside of time and space as you and I know it. Uh, Christ who knew you, Psalm 139, from your mother's womb, who sees all the rebellion we once had, who, who sees even the degree of apathy that many of us yet have today. Here is Christ looking upon you and I in our rebellion and apathy, and yet in eternity past somehow, he said to the Father, I am going to become one of them, and I am going to die a brutal, wrath-absorbing death in their place that they might come to know our astonishing love for them, that they might be reconciled unto us, that we might bring them to where we are, that we might share with them the glory of dwelling in glad-hearted fellowship for all of eternity. Now, I don't know about you, I cannot speak for you, but I myself intend on spending the rest of my life pursuing a, an, an even greater and ever-growing understanding of this astonishing love that God has for us that John described for you and I the last time we were together at the top of chapter 3. Because God tells me in his word, it is the only pursuit that will completely satisfy my mind, and it is the only pursuit that will entirely capture my heart. And, and he ought to know, right? Because he is the manufacturer of the mind and heart at all. He, he has created us all. He has wired us all to find our greatest joy in just that, pursuing him, glad-hearted pursuit of fellowship with him. Now, again, one of the great byproducts of being captured by the love of God, one of the great things that is produced in right fellowship with God is you and I being in good and right fellowship with one another. We, we've talked already here in First John, have we not, about uh, this very important idea that the relationships that you and I enjoy horizontally with one another, the health of those relationships, the vitality of those relationships, they are a direct function of the health of our vertical relationship with God. And so it makes sense that John now, having really highlighted the core of our vertical relationship with God in amplifying just the astonishing love of God, it makes sense that he would now begin to move back once again to the horizontal relationships you and I are to have with one another as adopted sons and daughters of the living God. Now again, as we've said a number of times here, uh, John, he, he is writing very conversationally, Uh, to whom he refers to as his spiritual children in the body of Christ. And and as we've said, he just continues to circle back over and over again to three, really three very simple themes, love, obedience, and truth. And yet each time as he returns to these themes, 
He's looking at it from a different point of view, a kind of new vantage point in such a way that serves to to really deepen our understanding of what it is he is speaking of. And, And what is very interesting here is that John, each time he circles back to a thing, he comes in just a little bit deeper. Again, like a good parent, Seeking to teach his kids through repetition, right? John, John comes back to ground he's covered before, but as he does so, again, he takes us in a little bit deeper. He sort of pulls back another layer of the onion, if you will. And, and what that produces in the teachable believer is what I like to call, um, for lack of a better term, another port of understanding. And, and so you've got a subject, and, and John gives us kind of multiple access points to understanding, like, like multiple entry points into the understanding of a thing, if that makes sense. And, and yet there's a, a progressive nature to it as well. He, he continues to bring us deeper into understanding. This epistle, it's like a kind of spiral staircase, if you will, that, that just keeps circling around, but yet really taking us deeper to the ground level of really understanding a reality. And so, for example, on the radar this morning, yes, we've talked about love for one another. We did that in chapter 2. But he did so in the broader context of light and darkness. Now we circle back to the idea of loving one another once again, but this time uh, John takes us deeper. He ratchets the deal up a little bit. And now he talks about loving one another with a much more weightier tone, if you will. He talks about it now as a matter of life and death, abiding in life and abiding in death. Now, what does all that mean? We'll get to that in the body of the study this morning. But what I want you to see by way of introduction here is how John is is kind of slowly progressing to ever widen and ever deepen our understanding of Christian love and obedience and truth. And we'll see this uh, really for the rest of the epistle. So, don't be thinking as you're reading ahead, and, and by the way, you'll get invariably more out of our time together if you do that, understand that. But don't be thinking as you read ahead, well, well man, we already talked about this. No, no. If you are a teachable individual, which, which by the way means you don't come to the Word of God in order to support your preconceived view, but you come to the Word of God in order to inform your view. If you are a teachable individual, John is always giving us greater nuance and greater understanding as he's circling back to these things. It's what we said last week, right? There is no limit to your growing upwards and into uh, just the things of God and the love of God. He is the inexhaustible treasure. So let's open our minds and hearts afresh again and let's see what the Lord has for us this morning. We get after it here in verse 11. Chapter 3, 1 John 3, verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now John takes a little rabbit trail here, but we're going to follow him. That we should love one another, not as Cain, verse 12, who was of the evil one or the wicked one in your translation and slew his brother or killed his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? John gives us two reasons. Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now again, let's remember what John is pushing back against here. You've got these charismatic false teachers kind of coming in and making a mess of the gospel. Christianity and the Christian expression has suddenly become very confused in these seven churches in Asia Minor that John's writing to. And so he's been describing for these guys, and he's been describing for you and I, look, this is what the genuine article looks like. This is what's going on in the life of the believer who is arrested by the astonishing love of God. This is what it looks like. You're going to see obedience to the word of God. You're going to see love for one another. And you're going to see a kind of sticking to the truth and abiding in the truth. And then he said in verse 10, the very last verse we read last week, he said, guys, the difference should be obvious to you, glaring to you. So different do these children of the devil look than the the genuine article. 
Now, what John is going to do here is he is going to contrast some real extremes in order to further amplify this difference between the believer and the unbeliever, in this case, contextually, between the real deal and these false teachers that are coming in and making a mess of the gospel. He begins in verse 11 by circling back to this familiar assertion, right? Uh, We just saw a couple of weeks ago in chapter 2, verse 24, he said there, this is the message you heard from the beginning. So, uh, again, very familiar language from John. He's saying, guys, don't be running after this new garbage. If it's new, it's not true. This is the message that we gave you before these false teachers began to think so highly of themselves. And and then again, guys, I, I want you to watch what John's doing. I want you to see what he's doing. Having spoken of the vertical, the, the core of our vertical relationship, which is the astonishing love of God last week, he comes back now to hit again this horizontal aspect. And so he says, this is also part of the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So he's always doing that, going from the vertical right to the horizontal because they're causal. Now, verse 12 is very, very interesting, and it's where John um, begins to set up this kind of extreme contrast. But, but to really have a handle on that, we're going to look ahead just a little bit, and then we'll come back. So look at verse 16 with me. Just jump down to verse 16. Uh, this is something we know from the Gospels. He says in verse 16, We know love by this, that he, speaking of Christ, right, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So John's saying Christ laid down his life for us, and we've got to handle that to get the contrast that he's going to set up with Cain. So verse 16, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because it's exactly what Jesus said on the very same subject in John 15. Jesus said this, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. I want you to mark the symmetry to what Jesus says and what John has been telling you and I um, in, in his epistle. And it's just fantastic. These things I have spoken to you. Now, does this sound familiar? That your joy may be, that my joy may be in you and that your joy be made full. And didn't John tell us in chapter 1, verse 4, that that was the reason he was writing this epistle, that our joy would be made full. This is my commandment. Notice singular. That you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for his friends. That's what we just saw, verse 16. So here's the definition of love. And then we'll really hammer this in a little bit. That one lays down his life for his friends. And, and, and what's the extreme example we have of that? Well, it's what John said in, in verse 16 in our chapter here. It was Jesus laying down his life for you and I. That is the extreme example we have about how love is defined in the Scriptures. Now, so, so kind of tuck that away for a minute, okay? Back to verse 12. Now, John just said in verse 11, stick to what you had from the beginning. Man, love one another. That's verse 11. And now he goes on to further amplify that now in a couple of ways here in verse 12. So, love one another, verse 11. Verse 12, not as Cain did, who was uh, of the evil one and who slew his brother. Now, this is just super interesting on on a number of levels here. First of all, um, John is saying, look, this love one another business you got to get back to that, but you got to get way back to the beginning. And so what he's doing is he's taking these guys, in fact, all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. And it's interesting, Bible students, this is the only time in this epistle that John quotes the Old Testament, and it's the only time that he uses a proper name, Cain. So John's making a point here. John's saying, look, Way before the days you were living in, before the church age, but before the law even, before all the the priestly rituals and ceremonies, and, and even, in fact, all the way back before the flood, chapter 4, the message of God was love one another. This is how the original message of love one another was propagated. They, they would say, love one another, don't do what Cain did. Now, uh, the contrast is this. This guy didn't love his brother. He killed his brother. And so employing extremes here, you have John using Jesus who lays down his life for his brother, and then you have Cain that 
just lays down his brother. Now, to set this up a bit better, we got to follow this trail just a little bit. we got to do a little homework in Genesis 4. Most of you know Cain and Abel, uh, sons of Adam and Eve, so we're going way back, right? Now, Genesis 4 tells us that Cain and Abel both brought an offering before God and that God rejected Cain's offering and favored Abel's. Even contextually, man, no small point there, because the scripture does not present Cain as an atheist, but rather as a worshiper, bringing an offering, which, of course, fits perfectly with John's context here in 1 John because, of, because those of, of um, false faith present themselves as, as religious individuals. The children of the devil masquerade as true believers. It's exactly what John's been telling us here in 1 John. He called them what? Antichrists in chapter 2. So here's Cain. He is put off that his brother has found favor with God, and so he decides to kill his brother. Now, that story in and of itself is just pregnant with insight. And if you want to go back to our study in Genesis 4, uh, I, I would encourage you to do so. But it's very telling there that Cain, when you consider also what the, the full counsel of, of God, when you look at what the writer of Hebrews says and, and what Jude says, um, it, what, what's interesting there is, is that Cain, um, Abel's offering was based on faith. Okay, Hebrews 11.4. And Cain's offering was nothing more than religious duty. As you study and harmonize what the, the, the Word of God says about this story, it's very evident that Abel offered a sacrificial atonement in accordance with the instructions of God while Cain brought the works of the flesh from the field. And so... What the story of these two brothers tells us, among other things, is that right from the get-go, man, right out of the gate, God was more interested in us celebrating his work than bringing forth our own, okay? It's not what you can do for God. And this message goes all the way back to Genesis, all right? It's not what you can do for God. It's what God has done for us. That's the gospel, And so God's been painting that picture from the very first pages in the Bible way back in Genesis. Now, again, I know this is another Bible study. And, man, I'll tell you what, I I was very tempted to just pause in 1 John here and go back and study the story of Cain and Abel because it's so crazy and insightful. But one more thing i got to tell you because it's just amazing that, that John chooses Cain to frame his point in. Super interesting. And, man, this kind of stuff to me just screams of the divine authorship of the Scripture. Scripture, or maybe John was just that smart. I don't know. But, but there's great symmetry here because here we have John transitioning from the vertical relationship we have with God now to the horizontal relationship we're to have with each other. And, and what Old Testament picture does he use to frame this in? But the story of Cain. What did the story of Cain come right on the heels of? The story of Adam and Eve. So you have Adam and Eve sinning in their vertical relationship with God, and then right on the heels of that, the very next chapter in the narrative, you have Cain sinning in his horizontal relationship against his brother. And now here's John, after talking about being made right with God, he's he's now saying, love your brother, framing that in the story of the very first horizontal sin recorded in the Bible that followed the very first vertical sin recorded in the Bible. If that's a little too Bible geeky for you, it doesn't make it any less stunning, but I get that, get over it, try this. John is saying, man, All the way back from the beginning, from the beginning chapters in the Bible, your relationship with God is going to have an impact on, it will be a driver of the catalyst for, it is going to determine this relationship, the quality of your relationships with one another. Because one of the things we learn from chapters, Genesis chapters 3 and chapter 4 is, If mom and dad have a problem in their relationship with the Lord, well, shouldn't be any real shocker that their kids are going to have problems as well, right? John is saying, love one another. Don't do what Cain did. Now, John does give us insight here in verse 12 about how Cain actually killed his brother 
and why he did it. So, so let's look at that. And we'll firm up this contrast, make the application, and keep the train moving on down the tracks. Uh, very, very interesting because John tells us in chapter, uh, verse 12 what Genesis 4 does not tell us, how he killed his brother. You're not given that detail in Genesis 4. John gives it to us here. This word that John uses for slew, or you might have murdered in your translation. Now, there's one Greek word that he could have used for to murder or to kill in general, but, but that's not the word that he uses. John uses a very specific word for murder that was used in the Old Testament to describe how the priests killed the sacrificial animals. Okay, The same word here, the Septuagint is... I'm not trying to get geeky here with you either, but the Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. Same word that's used here that was used to describe uh, animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. This Greek word here is, is sphadzo, and it means to slice the throat. Okay? Now, again, when you really immerse yourself in this story, it's almost as if Cain was saying to God, Oh, oh you didn't like my offering? You want a sacrifice? Well, here's your sacrifice. And he goes and kills his brother. He, in effect, sacrifices his brother in no doubt the way that he's been instructed in animal sacrifices. They, they were instructed. This is how this works. God instituted, you remember, the first animal sacrifice at, towards the end of chapter 3 to cover the sin of Adam and Eve. And so Cain, man, he, he couldn't go Google, how do I kill a person? I mean, he couldn't watch any R-rated movies. I mean... He, this is what he saw. The only, the only thing that he probably saw was the instruction in, in animal sacrifices. So John is telling us that's how he killed his brother. And so Cain, he literally sacrifices his brother. And then read the story. He lies about it. He's mouthing off to God. I mean, it's where we get the, you know, the, the phrase, am I my brother's keeper? That all comes from this brother here. He was one bad seed. And it's why John says in verse 12, he was of the evil one or of the wicked one in your translation. John is saying Cain was a child of Satan, of the evil one. Now, what's also insightful here is the word that John uses for evil or wicked because it's one thing to be evil or wicked, right? I mean, we all know people who are just a little bit um, bitter and angry and mean and resentful and all of this business, but they're just mean people and they would prefer that you leave them alone. That's not the word that John uses here. This word for evil or wicked here, this is the word poneros, and it means literally to affect or influence. There's an evangelistic sense to this word. In other words, you're not satisfied just in being mean or angry or resentful or bitter, but misery loves company. You want to take as many people into that as possible, and that's what Satan does. He's not content being wicked and mean and evil and, and all these things, but he, he has a desire, a deep desire to bring those with him. It's what Jude calls in, in his epistle the way of Cain. Now, why did he kill his brother? Okay. Well, the first reason John tells us here, there are two of them, because his deeds were evil. Again, the same word, paneros, there. We'll get to the second reason in a minute. Cain sacrificed his brother because he wasn't satisfied being wicked unto himself, right? Uh, but for his own selfish purposes. Uh, this dude was spiritually dead and wanted to take somebody with him, okay? There's a lot of layers to this, but, but it, Cain sacrificed his brother for his own selfish purpose, uh, purposes because his deeds were evil, first of all. And then isn't it interesting, centuries later, the Jewish leaders, whom Jesus too would call children of the devil, they would do the very same thing to him. And so here now is the contrast, having done a, a little bit of homework here, here, here's the contrast that John so very powerfully and efficiently, just great economy of words there, this is the sharp contrast that he sets up in chapter 3. Here is Jesus Christ, and he sacrifices his own life out of love for other people. And then here you have Cain. He sacrifices another person out of love for himself. Again, back in verse 10, John said the difference between the children of God and the children of Satan. Did he not say that in verse 10? He said it would be obvious. So now he takes us a little bit deeper 
And he says this. He says, you want to know God's kids from the devil's kids? By contrasting Christ and Cain, he says it's as simple as this. God's kids will sacrifice themselves out of love for others. And Satan, Satan's kids will sacrifice others out of love for themselves. Now, not every Christian is willing to die for another person, and not every unbeliever is a murderer. We understand that. There, there are a number of levels in between these two extremes. But again, John, he's a black and white kind of guy, and so he just lays it out very directly here. Now, taken together, I think, really for you and I, um, the overall flavor, um, the overall tenor of chapter 3 is this. John is asking us, the Word of God is asking us, what describes you? What describes me? To, to which of these two extremes that, that John is laying out here, to which of these two do we tend to gravitate more towards? And look, it, it's a very simple diagnostic. Are, are, are we sacrificing ourselves for the purposes of others? I don't think God's calling anybody here to get nailed on a tree, okay? But I mean, t- sacrificing your, your time, your resources, your convenience, and the interests of others, right? Are we sacrificing ourselves for the purposes of others? Or are we sacrificing others for our own purposes? Are, are we drawing upon the resources and, and conveniences and, and time of others for our own selfish gain, Right? So that's the diagnostic. Are we, that's what he's setting up with this extreme. Are we sacrificing ourselves in the elevation of others, in the interest of others, or are we, in effect, sacrificing others in the interest of ourselves? And those are the kinds of questions we would do well, um, I think, to wrestle with and, and pray through in the quietness of our own hearts. Uh, now, if you are a child of God, all right. If you are a child of God, John is going to be speaking to you very directly as a brother or sister now. He, he's talking to you if you're a child of God in verse 13. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Now, on a very direct level, here's my analysis of verse 13 in one word. Duh! Duh! Right? Okay, that's two words. Now, why did Cain murder his brother? Well, because the the first reason John gives us, it's what evil people do. I mean, history is just filled with stories of the persecution of the saints. Read the last five verses in Hebrews 11. John is saying, look, don't marvel. And and in the Greek, it's a a seeking, it, it seeks to discontinue the language. He's saying, stop it, quit it, cut it out. Don't marvel. Don't be surprised by the fact. Don't let it bother you that the people of the world who are opposed to Christ hate you. Now, again, we understand there are degrees here, but but here's what I would say to you in the spirit of John's uh, being a bit of a diagnostician here in 1 John. If you are living your life on the level that Christ would have you to be living your Christian life, then yes, there is going to be some degree of opposition being ushered in your direction by those who are hostile to Christ. Now, if you are a person where, where, look, man, the subject of your faith never comes up in your life with family or friends or, or co-workers or neighbors. If you are never laying down some part of your life for others, I mean, if there is no evidence whatsoever of being a follower of Christ, if, if any evidence is absent to the sphere of people God has you in, well, again, you might want to consider your profession of faith with a degree of suspicion. Because this is not what the life of a person filled with the Spirit of the living God inside looks like. Again, guys, we, we got to get this, and it's so important. That the, the, the thrust of what John's trying to do here is, is give assurance. If you are a child of God, God, if you are a child of God, John wants you to be assured in that, confident in that. If you don't have a saving relationship with Christ, John wants you to know that. Because listen, man, a false hope, how unloving would it be to allow someone to continue in false hope? 
And so John is after assurance. Conversely, and this is the encouraging part, whatever opposition, you're a child of God, whatever opposition is coming your way, man, be thankful for that. I mean, that just shows that you're not of this world. Look, when you are, remember the context last week, practicing, not perfecting. When you are practicing righteousness, as John says here, and again, not perfecting it, we're, we're all imperfect in the execution of, of righteousness, but, but when pursuing, seeking, practicing, I, I don't care what you want to call it, when you are bringing forth obedience to the word of God, if that is the general direction of your life, what effect is that going to have upon an unbeliever? Well, they're either going to be very curious about you because God is in the process of drawing them in, or they're going to be what John's describing here. They're not going to like it one bit. Why? Because your living rightly, in fact, exposes that they are not. Your living a righteous life is proof to them that they do not have to live the way they are living. And if they like the way they are living, well, then they are not going to like you. Why did Cain kill his brother? Here's the second reason, because his deeds were evil and because his brothers were righteous. There you have it. And again, centuries later, the Jewish leaders will do the very same thing to Jesus. Your living a righteous life is going to expose and make angry and make resentful those who are practicing evil. Now, Maybe there are some of you out there, maybe you're coming under a little conviction, and and that's good. You're thinking, well, you know, I I go to church from time to time, and I I do churchy stuff. I'll I'll put a little money in the offering box once in a while. And, and I, you know, but I do not think I'm quite fitting the profile here that John's running here, all right? So I'm getting a little squirmy. I mean, how do I really know if I'm saved? Well, you're in luck because verse 14, this buds for you. Verse 14 is for you because John is going to tell you now exactly how to know. Verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life. Again, notice the gravity that John is making in the text, the gravity of the point. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Now, that's a bit of a heavier tone, isn't it? Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in Now, we have to be careful here because guys like Moses, David, Paul, all of these men had their hand in murder. Murder is not the unforgivable sin, Matthew 12, 31, right? Okay, Uh, John is saying here, you have to take it in the context of chapter 3. John's saying that that someone who habitually hates his brother, that's the context in chapter 3, someone who is in in a habitual kind of continual sort of perpetual hateful individual, that is not a saved individual. Here's the whole shooting match now in verse 16. This is it right here. We know love how? By this. So here's the definition of love. We know love by this, that he laid his life, he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, the tense there in the last half of the verse has the idea that, that we continually lay our lives down. But I want you to catch this. We know love by this, laying the down, uh, laying down of the life. Now, so, so there it is, man. And, of course, we back up to verse 14. This is how we know, all right? This is how we know we've passed from death to life. This is how we know that we are children of God. We love the brothers and sisters. Now, what does that mean, to love the brethren? I mean, does that mean I I go up to some guy after church and give him a big hug and, hey, come here, brother, I love you, and now I'm loving the brethren, and so, therefore, I, I have assurance? No, no. Look. 
John is defining, guys, get this, this is huge. John is defining this love for us in verse 16. He says there, we know love by this. This is the crystal clear definition of agape love that I am giving you. We know this by this, that he laid his life down for us. We just heard Jesus say the same thing in John 15. John wants us to wrestle this to the ground, get it down, get the three count and be done with it, right? This is the biblical definition of love. Loving your brother, that you lay your life down. That's it. Well, what does that mean? It means biblical Christian love. It is sacrificial in nature, and the object of its uh, the object is is the elevation of others. Biblical Christian love is sacrificial, and the object of its affection is to elevate others. That is the fruit, John is saying, of this eternal life abiding in me. It it, it is a fruit that is produced for the benefit of others. And it's what Jesus Christ supremely demonstrated on the cross for you and I. And then now John says here in verse 16, if you are a child of God, you will be laying down your life all the time. Present and perfect tense there. Present perfect tense rather there in the Greek. You will continually be setting self aside in the interests of others. I I am telling you, John has put this issue to bed, tucked it in, gave it a kiss, and said, good night. I mean, you can't not have a greater expression of finality and a definition than, than what we have there in verse 16. By this we know love, that we are laying down our lives for others as he laid his life down for us. Now, Since John is so just straight up black and white here, let's make sure we understand a couple of things. Now, again, John is not saying that this is how you are saved. John is not saying you are saved when you love your brothers this way. Loving your brothers this way does not hurt. Loving your brothers sacrificially, loving them in in the interest of, of elevating their needs above your own, this is not what earns or merit salvation for you. Again, it's just the inverse. John is saying, if you are saved, if you have salvation, this is the identifying marker. This is the evidence of saving faith that you are given over to, not perfect in, but given over to laying down your life for others. You are practicing. You remember this righteousness. And so again, does this mean that I, I am somehow, I have to be perfect in the execution of this? No, it does not. But it does mean there is a northward tra- trajectory, okay? That there is a, a kind of forward movement in a believer's life towards this love that is being described for us here. Now, if there is no movement at all here, you might even know a lot about the Bible. If you are never laying your life down, then John is saying you abide in death. And that is evidence there is no eternal life in you. Pretty serious stuff here. Now, just what does this love... We need you to just go a little farther for us here, John. What does this love look like on the ground in life? Verse 17. But whoever has the world's goods... Now, there's a couple words I'm going to have you underline there. Goods is one of them and sees his brother. So underline goods and sees. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, well, how does the love of God God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Now he says the world's goods here. This is the Greek word bios, and it means necessities, you know, food, clothing, shelter, these kinds of things. If you see a brother in need and you close your heart to that, by the way, very aggressive Greek word there, close, it means you're shutting the door on on the brother, right? Then John is saying, look, how can the love of God that I'm describing to you, how, how does this abide in you? If you are shutting down a brother in legitimate need, how how can you say the love of God is in you? And he addresses, and I love this, he addresses really an aspect of our carnality in all this in verse 18. He says, now now look, a a kind word isn't a bad thing, right? 
There's nothing wrong with a kind word, but that is not the act of love that God is requiring here. Okay? In other words, oh, I love you, brother. Good luck with that broken down jalopy of yours. I'll be praying for you in that car, man. Maybe I'll see you next week. No, no. That brand of Christianese is not going to help the brother out, is it? Now, again, nothing wrong with a kind word, but, but our, our words alone can have a, a kind of gushy, um, feely kind of carnality to them if there's no substance, if there's no action behind it. Now, John is not being naive either. There's a kind of warning in the original language there in verse 17. He says, and seize a brother in need. That word seize there, it means to research. It means to do your homework. Vine's New Testament Dictionary defines this as a careful look at the details, a closer contemplation. In other words, if you're helping out a brother who drives a $40,000 vehicle and has a $400 cell phone bill, you might better serve that individual by speaking the truth in love and offering some counsel on maybe some responsible decision-making. You lay the ax to the root, right? So John is saying there's an aspect of discernment and understanding in this very, very clearly in the text. But he's saying here, if you can discern that a brother is in need of the necessities, world's uh, goods, again, food, clothing, shelter, I, I think a strong argument can be made for transportation in our culture. If, if you can discern there's a brother that's just hit a rough patch in life, then the love of God in an individual that has the spirit of God dwelling within them, that is going to compel them to help their brother out. Look, it, it, it's this simple You just get back to how John is defining Christian love in the heart of a saved individual. Because you have been arrested, and we go all the way back up to verse 1, because you have been arrested by the astonishing love of God, you are going to have within you a desire to lay yourself down where there is the interests of a person in need. And listen, because I, I think we missed this. Listen, the very best way, friends, get this down. The very best way that you can make yourself ready, make yourself useful to others, is by practicing righteousness yourself. Okay? Practicing righteousness yourself is how you become a more usable vessel in the hands of God. All right, you're, you're pursuing God. You're, you're growing in your delight in God. Now, now, you are a person that is imperfect for sure, who among us is not, again, but you're a person that, that look, you're in the Word, you're in prayer, you're in fellowship with other believers, you're, you're doing what you can to make yourself ready. There is a state of readiness about you that at a moment's notice, you are ready to serve another human being in need. You have made yourself useful. You have made yourself ready by practicing righteousness yourself. Does that make sense? If you are built up and strong in your vertical relationship with Christ, man, you're going to be ready. If you're not, if you're weakened, if you're not in the Word, you're anemic, you're dragging your feet, you're going to miss a whole lot. You're just going to miss it. Now, again, we're not talking about got to keep getting back to this. We're not talking about what you do to get saved. John is talking about what saved people do. This is what saved people do. It's who they are, or it it is is what they are growing towards. Now, here's the stunning part in all of this. The people you are helping, well, sure, there's benefit to them. Of course there is. But the primary beneficiary to your helps? Well, that would be you. All right. Finally, this morning, verse 19. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart. There's benefit number one, if you're a note taker, assurance. And we'll assure our heart before him and whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Benefit number two, no condemnation. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Benefit number three, compromise. So just for you note takers, I'm going to go back over this. Assurance, no condemnation, confidence. But let's read these together because 
it's tough in the English to get what's going down here. So backing up to the second half of verse 19, and we'll assure our heart before him and whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Okay, so, so there are times John is writing to believers who are practicing righteousness. He's writing to believing individuals. Now there are times, and, and you know this, I know this, we all experience this to a degree. There are times when you are practicing righteousness where you're going to think, man, I, I don't know if I've done enough. Have I done? I mean, you could always give another dollar. You could always say one more prayer. You could always read one more Bible verse. So for those who are practicing righteousness, John's saying, look, man, relax. God is greater than your heart. You're all right. God knows your heart. It, it's okay. Okay? I was just in the middle of that there. Okay, in verse 22. And whatever we ask... We receive from him. Benefit number four, answered prayer. That's huge. Whatever we ask, of course, in Christ's name, right? We receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Well, what are his commandments? Verse 23. This is astonishing. This is his commandment. Notice singular. Singular. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and lives with him, communes with him, remains in him, fellowship with him, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us, which speaks to um, offer that testimony that we are his. Now, look, understand, friends, there are incredible benefits to running the program that the Lord is laying out for you and I. Incredible benefits. Now, no doubt, okay, no doubt, it is a believer, um, no doubt, it's a believer coming to just the, an understanding of the astonishing love of God. Yeah, man, that's the real launching pad that propels the Christian experience into a, no, a new gear, no doubt about it. And I'm telling you, man, I know some really, some pretty smart brothers who have been professing Christians for years and years who have yet to just be flat out arrested by the astonishing love of God. And so they've never hit this level that, that John's describing for us here. And so look, no doubt, again, it is being blown away by the love of God, extended towards us and Christ's sacrificial work on our behalf. There is no doubt that is the real um, launching pad that motivates a, a like Christian expression of, of Christian agape love towards others. You know, you're just delighting in, in God and you're, you're making yourself ready to, to lay your life down. And, and, and not, and by the way, not just in the weighty stuff, okay? Uh, understand that, but just in all kinds of super practical and, and profitable, just, just everyday kind of ordinary ways. And I'm telling you, God, God will put extraordinary on your ordinary. All right? now, now, maybe you're just taking the time to dispense encouragement and understanding. Maybe you're just going to listen. Maybe you're taking a brother to coffee to, 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 to share with them how much they have done or how they have lived their life, how that's encouraged you. Maybe you're making meals, as so many of you do for a sister who had surgery. Maybe you're praying for your brothers and sisters. They're on your mind and your heart. And so you stop what you're doing, and you take the time to just... F- Call them on the phone and tell them that you care and that you're covering them in prayer. Maybe you're serving in the kids' ministry from time to time so people can actually sit under the teaching of God's word. Do you see what I did there? (laughs) We need more of you. Here's what I'm telling you. You don't have to house 22 people or take the gospel to India, all right? Now, those are wonderful, selfless things to do. Don't miss what I'm saying. There are literally uncountable, little, practical, everyday kinds of ways in which you can lay down your schedule or lay down your convenience or, 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 or your time or a resource to, to just get up and minister to a brother or sister in need. You have no idea what kind of an influence that can have on the life of another human being. So many corners are turned that way because somebody laid down their own schedule to help a brother. Friends, that's what gospel community looks like. 
It's how this is supposed to work, man. Study the New Testament. 53 one another's in the New Testament. Love one another. Pray for one another. Correct one another. Care for one another. Bear one another's burdens. We could go on all day long. Gospel is intended to be done in community. God uses the church to, to grow you. You cannot grow outside of the context of gospel community. And we should talk a whole lot more about that one day. But if you are doing that, if, if you are laying your life down, then John is saying God comes right back around and rewards you. I mean, imagine these benefits, man. I mean, what a benefits package. Assurance, confidence, no condemnations, prayers being answered, and just super faithful, confident prayer life with God. That, that's what John's talking about. And then the granddaddy of them all, man, communion abiding, sweet, wonderful communion with the living God of the universe through the person of Christ. Now you've struck gold. Man, when you tap into that, man, the, 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 there is um, just a joy and a, and a peace and a, and a purpose and a, that, well, Paul says in Philippians 4, passes all understanding. I mean, there is something in that sweet spot that you discover in communion with your God that nothing in this world can touch. It just can't. And, and man, once you've tasted that, and brothers and sisters that have, you know, once you've tasted that, there's no turning back. I'm telling you. And listen, if you're not there yet, you are not less of a Christian. This book is an invitation. Right? If you're not there yet, don't beat yourself up. That's why God has you here today. And next week. And the week after that. And the week after that. You stay upon the path of discovering who he is and his unspeakably marvelous, astonishing love for you and towards you. And you will grow in the kind of delight that compels you to lay your life down and come into the kind of fullness of joy that John is saying uh, these benefits afford you. So you stay on the path. Again, man, if you're not there yet, uh, I want to point something out to you. We've got to keep getting back to this. Uh, notice how all this starts in verse 23. And I want you to notice the intentional singularity there. I kind of primed you on that earlier. He says, this is the commandment. Singular, verse 23. This is, the com- this is his commandment that you believe in the name of Jesus Christ and that you love one another. No. Two very interesting features in this singularity. First of all, notice that you are not saved by works. Okay, verse 23. There's no laundry list of commandments presented in the immediate context of verse 23. Why? You remember the crowd said to Jesus, uh, they super popular, he was a rock star at this point in his ministry in Jerusalem, went to the other side of the lake with the boys. The crowd catches up with him on the other side, and they say this to him. John 6, Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we we may work the works? They're asking about salvation if you go to John 6 and look at this context. What must we do to work the works of God? Works, plural. Jesus answered to them. He said, No, no, this is the work, singular. This is the work of God that you believe on him who he has sent. There is one act and one act alone that determines a person's eternal security, their salvation, and that is simply believing upon Jesus Christ. Look, new new Christians, men, you need to understand these various commandments that are laid out in the New Testament, commandments, plural, that would be verse 24, right? These commandments that are laid out in the New Testament, they are not hardships opposed upon you and I, all right? They are not intended to be hurdles for us to clear and a kind of effort to secure salvation. But the keeping of them, John is saying throughout this epistle, that is the very evidence that you've come to just a right and good and super rewarding relationship with God who designed us to delight in the keeping. The commandments of God, running the program of God for your life, it is how 
Having been saved, it is how you were led unto human flourishing and delight. And isn't it interesting, Bible students, that the very same law of God that is an enemy to the unbeliever, because it says you can't be good enough, right? The very same law of God that is an enemy to the unbeliever, isn't it interesting that for the child of God, the law went from being your enemy to your friend? Because Christ aced your entrance entrance exam. So the same law that condemns for the believer becomes a friend leading you into human flourishing and joy and delight. Not because you have to. That's been done. But it's what is best for you now and forevermore. The law of God, rightly understood, moves from enemy to friend for the child of God. We need to know that. The second thing, and we'll touch down here, second thing that is interesting about this singularity in verse 23, this is his commandment, and it's for all of us, and it's where we're going to touch, touch down again, and it's, it's what's on the radar today, coming back to loving one another. He says this is his commandment, that we believe in Jesus Christ and love one another, but, but that sounds like two commands to me. Why is he using this singular imperative voice here? I mean, love God, love people. That's two. No, no. And that's the stunning point John's making, and it's the stunning point he's been making all chapter long. The love of God and the love of people, these are inseparable events entirely, okay? They are not mutually exclusive. They are, they are together. It is a singular imperative commandment. Love God, believe in Christ, love other people. They are causal and harmonious and simultaneous. As you are loving God, you are loving other people. As you are growing in your love of God, you are growing in your love of other people. You cannot say that you believe in Christ and love God and not have a love for other people. That's what John is saying. Now, again, to be sure, you you don't love other people to get to God, but in loving God, you get the love of people thrown right in there. It's part of the deal. Now, will we struggle? Are some people tough to love? Of course they are. But we're talking, again, the general direction, the the, the practicing, the the flow, the, the defining movement in your heart. If you love God, it's going to be to love other people. And that person that you were so mad at before, now with the love of God inside, you, you don't look at them the same anymore. You realize that they had some kind of journey to get to that chair they're sitting in. And you begin to wonder, man, that person wasn't loved well as a kid. They weren't, they weren't loved well. Somebody hurt them. The love of God views this very, very differently. So this is the point that we we will land upon because we need to, because I think we get this turned around. It's a point that we must recognize. It's one that John has made before. It is one he will make again and again because of its verity. The success that you enjoy in these various relationships in your life, your spouse, your kids, your family and friends, your coworkers, the success in those relationships is a direct function of the relationship you have with your God and your creator and the lover of your soul. Where there is dysfunction in any of your relationships with other human beings, where there is dysfunction there, it is because there is some dysfunction in your relationship with your Lord and God. Make no mistake about that. Let me love you well. You go after that dysfunction, okay? You're going after them all. You're going after them all. So this week, let us make ourselves ready. First and foremost, by pursuing our relationship with with Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we do want to have good and right relationships with other people. I 
I really believe that most of us want that in our hearts, but, but God, where we get mixed up, as we spend the lion's share of our efforts trying to mend and fix and heal and put all this effort into to these relationships horizontally, when, when God, we ought to be putting the lion's share of our effort into our relationship with you. Because, Lord, when we are, when we are getting to know you and, and marvel over you and delight in you and, and when we, we begin to just love what you love and hate what you hate, namely sin, Lord, when our chief desire is to pursue you, we're going to have that assurance and that confidence and, and that security. We're not going to be insecure people running around trying to compensate in our relationships. Lord, Lord when we are singly engaged in pursuing you, that's when we're going to be the best mom or dad we can be. It's when we're going to be the best husband we could be, the best wife we could be, the best co-work we, we could be, the best, uh, the most successful relationships are all a function of our love in and for you. But, but God, we have it backwards. And, and so we're asking you this morning, Father, uh, the fight that we're in this week is to simply make the main thing the main thing. And Lord, that is you. you. You are the fountainhead from which every other area of our lives flows. Give us the grace and the strength and the mercy this week to understand that reality. May we seek you first, and these other things will be added. May we make much of Jesus Christ. May he be the ultimate object of our affection. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. All right, let's worship.